Hello and welcome. My name is Lena Foley and this is Off the Bench, a podcast about women's sport which we hope will entertain and inform sports fans of all ages and genders. You can find all our previous episodes on the podcast link on Off the Ball. Just go into offtheball.com, find the podcast link, scroll it down, you'll see Off the Bench, go in there and all our previous episodes are there. And also you can get us on iTunes. Um, we have a Twitter account, it's at Off the Bench OTB, capital OTB. Uh, so if you have any suggestions Suggestions or anything you want to send to us as well, you can get us there. We uh, we we talking generally about sport, uh, about Irish sport and sport internationally. And sometimes we see somebody that just catches our eye and really interests us. So today we're talking to a woman that we found very inspiring and fascinating when we came across her story. So we've invited her into the studio, particularly because she's involved in a sport that we don't see very much of, and that's squash. So Orla Darty. Welcome to Off the Bench. Hi, Cleena. Thanks very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Um, Orla, tell us something about yourself, first of all. Uh, well, I'm 48 years old, and I grew up in Port Marnock. Uh, I currently still live in Port Marnock. I coach squash about 20, 25 hours a week, and I also work in the fitness industry. So I'm in the gym there doing some personal training and teaching lots of spin classes. She was up, so, listeners. She yeah. was up at half five this morning because she had her first spin class at half six. Is that right? Dedicated uh, spinners come in. <laughs> they love it. Amazing. Yeah. Um, but you don't just work in the fitness industry. You also play competitive squash. I do play competitively. So I'm currently on the Masters Tour within Europe and I have sort of a mission that I want to try and win the World Championships in Poland in 2020 next year. And Masters Sport, so, for people who don't know that, is it's age group sport. Um, right. And what age group are you in? So it starts at age 35. Um, I'm in the over 45s. Now, when you play in European tournaments, you're allowed to play down in age group. But then once you come to the actual World Championships, you must play within in your, your category. Yeah. And they're normally in yeah. five-year categories in five all sports, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 So you you be over forty five would include forty five year olds to yeah. Once you turn forty five, you're in. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so that's one aspect of it. You play master squash, but you've yes. also achieved something unusual yeah. this year well, as well. Well, funnily enough, I I decided when I put my mind that I wanted to to go for the worlds. Uh, the best way to sort of get competition is to play with the youngsters, and so I started competing in the. It's called the senior. Uh, Irish tour for yeah. squash so I played in you know all the, the Leinster Open Munster Open all the Provincials and then the Irish Open and as luck would have it I made the Irish team <laughs> for my first time ever actually at age You'd 48. never played for Ireland before? No because when I was playing as a junior I always was on the Irish team as a kid but then I, I took off and that's another story yeah, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. We'll go into that in a minute exactly. But this is my first <laughs> time actually playing for the senior team wow. so I'm absolutely thrilled. And yeah. I'm presuming a lot of your teammates are younger than you? Well, yes. So there's four of us on the team, and uh, Brianne is going to we'll talk about her. She's going to be 24 in May, so half my age. And then Sophie is 18, and Laura is 19. Wow. So that's it. So I'm the mammy. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also competing on the same level as them. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which is a 100%, fantastic thing. Yeah, yeah. Look, we're going to talk about your career, where it's taken you, how it's done. Um, Orla Dart is a very interesting person, <laughs> listeners. All I can tell you is that because um, apart from being a squash player, she has appeared at Electric Picnic, <laughs> and she also has a very interesting medical history, which has informed some of your competition as well. Yes. So... Tell me about, um, were you good as a junior? You know, did you make it as a junior? What happened to you playing? I did. So I started playing when I was nine uh, out in Pomarnock. And um, my mother was quite ill when I was a kid. And my dad used to babysit us. And so what happened was he would bring us to his squash matches and we'd sit around waiting for him. And I got fed up waiting. So I just got <laughs> on the court and started hitting the ball. But subsequently, by the age of 12, I was being selected on the uh, Leinster team and then the Irish team right. and then played all the way through. I went to two world championships, one in Brighton, one in New Zealand. As a junior? As a junior in 87 and 89. Um, and then once I left the junior circuit, I moved to England. Um, I wouldn't say I was discovered, but somebody saw my, my match at the Irish Open against the world number one and... Uh, invited me to go train in England for four years on the Pro Tour. So um, that sort of took me away from Ireland then. Uh, I was in Reading, south of London, and I competed around the world. I got to be number 69 in the world. Um, as a, as, as a, as so an I was, adult? I was 18, so yeah, you were 18, 18, 18 19, playing, 20. Yeah, you were in adult competitions. Yeah, yeah and I mean, it was, it was tough back then. You really couldn't make a living unless you were sort of top 10 in the world. There was right. really no money in it. So the travel was expensive. Um, I was very fortunate in the club that I was based. Uh, I got to train with uh, 
Sarah Fitzgerald, who at the time was, she won the world championships five times. So I was surrounded by very elite players. And, um, you know, as I said, I got to top 70 in the world, um, but it's and, not enough. Um, was Madeleine Perry behind you? She's behind me. The listeners um, might know Ireland has had uh, the some world incredible number three in number, squash. Yeah. Madeleine Perry. Madeleine, I would say, player. now I hope I don't get this wrong, Madeleine, I think she's probably about five years younger than me. Right. Um, so she would have come after me. She would have probably been soaring through junior squash when I was sort of, yeah. you know, coming into my peak. Relatively speaking, again, with sports that aren't that well known, she's relatively unknown in Ireland, but the yeah. level that she reached oh, and her it success was unbelievable. Was top three in the world. Yeah, Incredible. she has retired now. Yeah. Um, uh, but people, you know, if they want to find out more about her, go and have a look and see just how great she was. Well, so, I'm kind of hoping she doesn't make a comeback for the world yeah. because she might be in my age group. <laughs> I was just going to say she could go back <laughs> into your age group, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so you were in England and then your life took you to America at some point. So I I initially came back from England for about a year. I, I basically got fed up and burnt out. The squash wasn't working out uh, from a professional level. And I was home for about a year and, um, well, I mentioned the gay thing. Um, I was working in Break for the Border the very first year that it opened up, just around the corner. Yes, I, I, I lied on, on, the in the interview and I said I was a bartender, which I wasn't. <laughs> We've uh, all done it, Orla. <laughs> so I got that job, but the same year, I was about 22, I'd say, I came out, I was gay, I still am, and my parents were not too pleased, as you can imagine back then, and I think up until 93, it was, it was still legal, it was very frowned upon. And, yeah, um, of, there would have been a So it was, it was a worry, my, my parents were both very worried about me, and a couple of my friends had applied for the green card to go off to the States, and my, yeah. my dad said, why don't you just apply, you know, you're going to have a miserable life here, um, see where it takes you and in actual fact I was the only one out of my four friends who won it won it that same she August got a green card yeah and uh, landed in San Francisco with about 500 pounds in my pocket and what year is this? this was 93 right so I was 22 um, very naive and everybody was sure I'd come back you know Within, You'll be back within, within a year yeah, or two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the first job I ever got, it was in Mrs. Field's cookie factory. <laughs> I was wearing one of those hats. You know, <laughs> on the, uh, when Ireland didn't call biscuits cookies. No, this is it. <laughs> um, but, you know, luckily enough, my squash really took me to so many places. I ended up staying. I met a, 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 a woman, I'll say, who, you know, love brings you places. And I ended it up does. going to Las Vegas, of all places. And there was a squash club there where I walked in and I hadn't played for about a year and uh, picked up a racket and there was a woman standing behind the court. Her name is Amy Milanic and I call her my squash angel. She lives in America now. Uh, she said, who the hell are you? And how, you know, how are you okay. able to hit the... This girl's got So <laughs> I kind of brushed it off, didn't want to know. I was kind of had my thing with squash. But anyway, she found me. She saw my name in the visitor's guest book and she tracked me down and she came and she literally knocked on my door and she said, you've got to start playing again. Wow. So, um, and she was my bridesmaid and we ended up being fantastic friends. So I got back into the squash and ended up working for her as a part-time uh, coach, coach in Vegas. Um, met another woman, as you do, and got a job in Brooklyn in the Heights Casino, which is probably one of the most established squash clubs in America. Right. Uh, for a woman named Alicia McConnell, um, who subsequently is now living in Ireland. Another story. It's a great story. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> uh, and became a full-time squash coach. So basically, I had sort of that two-year break where I didn't, you know, travelled, went to America, did what, what I was going to do. And here I am suddenly coaching in the United States. And was it, and was it big in America and could you make a living? It was absolutely, yes. Yeah. So at the time, as an assistant coach, you get a salary just to be there. And at the time, I was probably making about $1,000 just to be there. And then the amount of coaching that you can do depends upon yourself. But I was making a handy living, you know, up to 3000 a month at the time anyway. Right. And this is 94, 95. Yeah, yeah. Um, just coaching. Just coaching. And squash was obviously bigger in America. Yeah, and I was really lucky to get into this particular club, the, the Heights Casino. Anybody who knows squash in America will be very familiar. It's, it's uh, by far one of the best clubs in the country. Did you say it was in... It's in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, right. Yeah, so you were Heights based Casino. in New York. Yeah, yeah. Right. Had a great time there. Um, from there, I got a phone call out of the blue from a chap named Richard Millman, who's also an absolute legend of American squash, if anyone in America is watching this. Richard Millman was working at Cornell University at the time oh. and was deciding that he was going to make a change in his uh, career path. 
and he said we're looking for a female head coach for Cornell University which is one of the Ivy League yeah, schools Ivy which League, is yeah. what an opportunity so I was probably 26 27 wow. went for the interview uh, got the job and coached at Cornell University for probably three years and so a lot of the students were close to my age so I was yeah. 27 they're you know 20 yeah. 23 but I had a fantastic time and brought the team from sort of bottom 20 in the country up to top eight in the country wow. now i was lucky to have a spanish player show up on my lap and she was amazing <laughs> but, uh, we all need looking like yeah <laughs> um so and from there i hope i'm not rambling but no. i um wanted to be close to my partner who at the time was living in boston right and uh, it was a tough commute. Cornell is kind of in Ithaca, which is very, very far north in, in New York, yeah. upstate New York. Um, and there, I was always interested in sort of urban programs. And there was a new, brand new urban program opening up called Squash Busters, right. which um, was the very first of its kind. And what it did was it catered to underprivileged children, uh, invited them to play squash, do their homework, get out in the community help in the community and it was a fantastic initiative by a man called Greg Zaff who is also, I'm pretty sure he's in the Hall of Fame at this point um, I rang him up and I said this is something that really interests me is working with underprivileged youth and uh, he, he was looking for a squash coach, coach uh, as you do so went for the interview um, got that, we were li literally based in a, in a tiny trailer um, he, his office was in his, his, his house and he, had a, he rented a 12 seater van and we used to go around and pick up the kids and we were given uh, the use of courts at the Harvard Club in Boston, which is a very prestigious elite club that you would go in and you can only wear your white clothing and, you know... A bit like Fitzwilliam here. Well, suppose, it's yeah. very similar. Yeah. And, you know, bringing in these underprivileged and, you know, every race we're talking... Yeah. Still, even back in the 90s, it was Multiple a little bit kind of, yeah. at the time, what, you know, why are these kids here kind of thing. Um, we were allowed to use the courts there. We also were allowed to use there was courts at the YMCA, old racquetball courts. Yeah, because I in in in, in urban America you see handball courts because the Hispanics play handball yes. as well. So you do see walls and courts outdoors, yeah. even yeah. in downtown New York. Absolutely. So you could use those as yeah, well for so an we urban were, kids program. Exactly. We were, we Amazing. would use whatever we could, and then we were allowed. There was a little chapel in the YMCA that we went to do our study. So we, they would do their homework. We'd have volunteer tutors come in and help the kids with their homework, and that was probably I'd say one of the most fulfilling. Yeah, jobs I've ever fabulous. had. Yeah. So I was there with them for nearly 10 years. Um, right. At the same time I was there for the last three years, you're going to laugh, I got a little part-time job with JetBlue uh, just to try my hand at something different. And I'm going to tell you a story about that in a minute, how I crashed the jet bridge into the plane, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> I also worked part time. When you say JetBlue, you're obviously in airlines. Yes. So were you working? Were you 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 were yeah, working just stewarding? Yeah, supplement. No, I was. Uh, uh, I suppose the person at the desk who would check. Oh, right. In. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They wouldn't let me on the plane. They were grand staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Grand staff. But that was because I was about to get married and we needed a little bit more income. Um, and then I also had a part time job at MIT, which is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Technology, which is a fantastic school, coaching the men's team. And these guys are the most intelligent people like it was difficult to coach them because they were all about the angles intellectual and the, thinkers yeah you know, yeah yeah science scientists and thinkers fantastic experience um and then from there so that was 10 years in boston um i had a very good friend demer holleran who was uh the u.s champion over i'd say 10 times over in both singles and doubles and she was about to open uh, her own club in philadelphia with 12 squash courts and two doubles courts and she was looking for somebody to help her sort of open it up and run it and we'd been friends for a long time so it was a great opportunity to sort of step a little bit away from the coaching and into more management of right. a club yeah yeah so you know i've been coaching at this point probably 13 years so i went with, with demer to um open this club had a fantastic time uh i was there probably two years my father passed away right. and i had a really difficult time with it right so all hell broke loose uh, got divorced, got uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, was admitted wow. uh, many times. I have some incredible stories about being inside, <laughs> on the inside. Um, it was a really hard time. And was so, there, can I ask you, was there, do you think that there was, uh, had you struggled with your mental health? Was there an underlying condition or was it all brought on by, by that incident? No, or do, I would or were say, you ever worried about your mental health before yeah, that? Yeah, but you know, back then it, was, it, was, it wasn't really considered 
you know, people didn't know what it was. I would say I was always very, very, very uh, either, you know, I'd be the person who'd stand on the table and dance. Yeah. And then I'd go into dark places and, and but would never go outside and suffered a, a fair bit from paranoia where I didn't want to be around people. And, and I, you know, I didn't, I, I can remember as a child even feeling depression at the age of 12, 13. Wow. Um, but, you, you know, Nowadays, well, we didn't put a, we didn't we didn't really, put we didn't, a name on things I mean, back I, then. When I, we weren't we weren't yeah. as vocal about. And stuff. when I told my family, I rang them and I said, "Listen, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder." The first thing my brother said was, "Is that some sort of bear thing from the North Pole?" Or you know, nobody really could understand. And then my cousin uh, thought I had cancer and I was terminal and was going to die. You know, even the term bipolar, yeah, um, which as you know is is the same as manic depression, and a lot of people didn't understand that manic depression is mania and depression. It suffers, it's, it, it's, it's a, a it's huge a, arc, it's a big arc, I expect. Yeah, you. so... And, ha and, and so how, how was that treated and how, how, so, how did So you in America they were very on top of it, but uh, you know, the very first thing they want to do is medicate you. Which medicine, yeah. And of course I didn't know if I should say yes or no and my family didn't know what to do, so they're like, of course you have to go on the medication. Um, because I did try uh, a suicide attempt. Um, oh so anyway, I was put on some pretty serious stuff. Lithium was one of the ones I was on and I'd say over the course of the next 10 years I was pretty severely medicated. Um, you managed to find a way to deal with it but uh, I think the, the biggest thing I struggled with was the numbness. So I, I have the this, not I have a, I'm told I have a nice sort of bubbly personality, you probably disagree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having met you briefly people, <laughs> people were noticing that I'd be very, you know, if I went to a party or whatever, or even out socially uh, playing squash, I was sort of low key, kept to myself. Um, and I definitely dabbled with, I'd stop taking the meds for maybe a month and then you kind of go, woo, and then suddenly you crash down again. So it was, it was a case of, can I cut back on the medication or, you know, what do I do? How do I manage it? Um, I had a very, very good friend. Her name was Debbie Brown, who I'd met in Minneapolis at a squash tournament. And around the time that my father died, she rang me up and she was living in Santa Barbara. And she said, you need some sunshine, get your butt out here. And she had frequent flyer miles, whatever. So anyway, here's where it gets interesting. We'd been friends for a long time. When my father died, I got divorced. I flew out to California to get some sunshine because I'd quit my job because I'd been diagnosed with bipolar disorder because yeah. I was hospitalized. Uh, it turns out, I had a great time and uh, Debbie and I fell in love. And uh, there was a job going as a head squash pro <laughs> in Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara. Um, and, you know, at the time we thought this town isn't big enough for both of us because it's a pretty small town. Yeah. And uh, she's also a very vivacious person. But we made it work and I subsequently moved out there and uh, was there 10 years. And we got married about five years later. Wow. Um, and we had a great time there. I was the head coach, uh, making a really nice salary there. And then at the same time, Debbie was involved with this urban program that I had done something similar in, right. in Boston. So I partnered with her and we ran this program called the Santa Barbara School of Squash. And it was for mostly Latino students, um, a lot of Mexicans who had come up illegally um, and be beautiful people, really, really. We had such a great time with them. We still keep in touch with these kids. They write letters to us all the time. Um, taught them squash, did their you know homework with them, went out into the community, cleaned the beaches, fed soup to the homeless, you know, yeah. fantastic. And so I was doing that with Debbie part time, and then I was also coaching quite a fair bit. And how was your health at this point? So I was still on medication. Um, I think the weather did me good. Yeah. I was definitely happier. Uh, sunshine, sunshine, yeah, sunshine does does, mm. does really help. Um, but I kind of knew at the back of my mind that I wanted to be off the meds at some point in my life. I wanted to try and manage it myself. And about four years ago, I'd say, I found a really nice uh, psychiatrist who um, was sort of managing. I actually was admitted twice in Santa Barbara as well um, for mania. So right. it was a question of how do you manage the mania. Um, but this particular doctor, I, I went into him and I said, look, I really want to try coming off the medication. And it was really important to him that I took at least six months to do so. Mm. You can't sort of just go cold turkey. Yeah. Um, and he was great and he sort of helped me do this and you, obviously you need counselling and the whole nine yards but when you have a good support system yep, around you yep. I have great friends, Debbie's fantastic um, and I've since been off for the last four years and knock on wood, you know you definitely have your moments but yeah. I think since I've started really involving myself in squash again 
Yeah. It's, and I, I suppose this curious. is why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I was curious as to whether, as to, as to, as to how important do you feel your immersion back in squash and at elite level squash, how that has benefited from you, for you I'd mentally say as physically? It's been absolutely huge for me. Um, you know, I, I, I was ill, just to get back to one quick thing, about two years ago I had a, a little mini stroke, a little TIA. Um, where I lost the power in the side of my f this left side, and then I've I've had a little loop recorder inserted, and then about a year later, which would be a year ago from now, I kind of was just like, what is going on? I just want to get back into squash again, be fit again. Um, I was sort of encouraged by a friend of mine, Kathy McGivney, at the Marnock Sports and Leisure Centre. Why did you get certified to be a personal trainer? It sort of goes hand in hand with your coaching. Yeah. And as I was taking this course, I was getting fitter and stronger. Um, I also met uh, Clean O'Connor, who you know, yeah, just former complete, Dublin ladies go yeah, football all star. Yeah. Um, completely randomly, she was looking for squash lessons, and uh, had reached out to me. And I, I did take forever to get back to her. But so w whenever we we ended up uh, coaching, I was coaching her for squash for about three or four months, and she also was encouraging me. Why don't you play again? Why don't you keep, you know get competitive? And, and I had this sort of desire to, to compete because I, I had been playing quite well and I was keeping my hand in it. I was playing league in Sutton and uh, I was just, I think at my age, I was starting to enjoy playing more. Whereas right. before, it was almost like I was playing for other people, not for myself. Yeah. And uh, so Clean and I came to this arrangement where I would give her free squash lessons. She would get me in the gym and kick my butt into shape. And of course, doing this personal training course. So it was all coming hand in hand. Everything sort of happened together. And I um, set my mind on winning the World Championships. And I went and played in the Welsh Masters last December. Um, I'd become fairly fit compared to what I was. Um, and got to the final unseeded and lost uh, to a lady from, I don't want to get it wrong, Slovakia. Henrietta was her name. And was absolutely thrilled. So that was step one. Okay, I can do this. I can compete yeah. with the Masters in Europe. And you get a taste for it. Yeah, yeah. And the competitive and edge kicks back in. Um, but, but, you know, to answer your question about the mental health side of things, being fit and strong and then suddenly performing at a high level in a sport that I've always loved but never superly enjoyed, and now it's all happening together, and it, I, I feel absolutely fantastic at the moment. I've found this joy, and that sounds yeah. very deep. No, it's not. But it's sort people of find their joy. joy in sport all it's the an, time. It's amazing, and people look at me and say, how are you doing it all? You're 48. And, you know, I'm training in the gym, you know, thanks to Kleena, she's got me really doing the right things and she's she's very, very good at what she does. Kleena works as a performance coach as well. She, she? Yes, yeah, and, she, and she has been doing that for me my last three tournaments, uh, the Irish Masters, Slovenia and Spain, and Kleena will pick up the phone and she'll spend, an, you know, an hour saying, and she'll break down, what are your tactical goals? What are your, what's your mindset? What are your technical goals? And she'll, she finds a way to ask all the right questions that get me thinking, because I tend to yeah. go, you know, I kind of, you know, I overload, I overthink. Um, she has me doing little stupid things like two hours before the match, don't even think about it, do a puzzle, you know. Yeah, take your mind away from take it completely. Your mind completely. So she has all these tools that uh, she's equipped me with. Um, and, she's, and the results have been good. And well, I won Spain, I won Slovenia, I won Ireland. So you won the Slovenian Masters and you won the Spanish Masters since since the start of the season. Yeah, and the Irish Masters. And the Irish Masters as um, well. You got selected on the Irish, Irish senior, senior team. team. Yeah, and you're so it's going been quite a whirlwind of a year. We're going to the European Championships in two weeks in, two weeks Birmingham. Time. in Birmingham. And so all there's 23 countries from Europe are competing, and, and there's going to be, you know, t probably seven of the top ten countries in the world will be there. And and is it also, is it, uh, because squash, you know, and we'll talk about the renaissance, but because it's not a big competitive sport here, do you have to self-finance? How do you manage for... Yeah, for I'm self-financing at the moment. Now, the nice thing about the Europeans, because it's a senior event, uh, Irish squash are, are, pay, are, are paying, paying for that, for Ireland, yeah. but any of the European stuff. that also is, a, is all you know coming out of my pocket. It's tough, but you know it's it's what you love. It's what I love, and it's making me happy at the moment. People so. might be looking and wondering about your uh, your choice of clothing. Yes, um, one of the things that caught my eye <laughs> about for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about clean in a minute. One of the things that caught my eye with you, actually, um, on your social media was that you wear really bright colours when you're playing. Um, first of all, where do you get your gear? And Because yeah. people are going to know. And secondly, um, why is it important to you to wear bright clothing? Yeah, I think, so I, I'm very lucky. I have a, a, a friend, his name is Alan Byrne, and he uh, started out, he sponsors me for my equipment, which is a company called Salming, and he was giving me my rackets and shoes and bags. And um, when I started getting 
successful, I kind of said, hey, wouldn't it be nice if I had some clothing? Yes, <laughs> you of course. Get, you get a little bit cocky. <laughs> and he smiled and he, he has a company in Ireland called Stuff Marketing and he, he ex imports uh, a brand called Lucky in Love. Now they're a from, that's the name sport, of... A sports clothing brand? They're a, they're a tennis and golf clothing... Specialist. Uh, ...based in Miami. Ah. And um, their uh, sort of leader of, of their uh, sort of logo look brand is uh, Bethany Maddox-Sands, who's a very well-known tennis player in America. Right. So she, I think, designs the, these clothes. And so he's brought it over to Ireland and it sells in Fitzwilliam and it sells in Sutton. And <laughs> it's... I've been wearing it, and I love it because it's so bright. It and, is and bright. It's really eye-catching. You know, people laugh at my this this jacket. This is lucky in love, <laughs> and uh, this is also one of their shirts. But it's it's just bright, and I I, I I feel good when I'm out there. And you you know, people are now coming to me in tournaments and saying, "What's it going to be today? What are you, what are you going to wear later?" And they they just love, and it's good for the camera. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It's attractive. So it makes you feel good to wear something bright, yeah, and yeah. as you say, it's it's eye catching. Yeah, and it probably can lead to other stuff because people will know notice you because I noticed it on <laughs> social media is one of the things I noticed I went wow look at her pig socks and you know that's great <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because because so many sports need a visual element and yeah. squash for years was very white and yeah. you know male and and, and exactly. very staid if you like yeah. um, uh, that's that's a certainly that's an interesting element of it um, I've noticed just from looking in the last few years watching uh, uh, again stuff around the world I've seen squash being played in glass courts and yeah. I've seen it been in like in, in um, I think Grand Central Station I saw one and I saw one in Dubai in a supermarket. Yeah. Is squash getting really modern now? It's get, it's, and what's it's, with the glass cases? Well, <laughs> the, the glass the, courts. Any uh, pro professional event now that you would look at uh, on it's it's on Eurosport. Uh, PSA squash have their own TV. Um, there will always be a glass court, and so the four, the four walls are glass. And the way they have it designed is the back wall. You can see out once you're in the court. You can see out because you need to see the referee, etc. But the other um, side walls and back wall would be sort of uh, tinted. Like, yes, yeah, so, so you can. So you're see. able to. So, so you and I could watch and see in perfectly well. So you can sit on the side and sit on the front wall. But well, the, when you're in it, you see out. It's, no, it's not a distraction oh, at all. Right. And uh, a lot of it has to do with you know. We're dying to get into the Olympics. It should be an Olympic sport. I mean, Forbes magazine rated as the most healthiest sport in the world. Um, very high endurance levels, brilliant cardio. It's, very, it's cardio unbelievable. Rates, You'll yeah. burn 800 calories in an hour of squash, no bother. Um, and it's it's accessible. Uh, but the thing with the ball is it's not as visual as... This is one of the things they come back and say is it's not like for TV, for the Olympics. It's very difficult Hard to, to, show to see it. To so see they're, it I mean, they're, they're working, they're designing the... the the material and the ball now it's it's a white ball and the the floor would generally be you know blue or darker color so you can see it and then the walls would be a darker color so it's really if you watch any you know youtube professional squash and they have them in the pyramid the pyramids in egypt yeah i've I, seen you that said yourself, grand, glass. Grand, you know in in, in uh, supermarket huge shopping, shopping centers. centers yeah yeah um there's one in uh, in the symphony hall in boston um, you know, and when I go to That's Birmingham, used competitively. Well, you, you break do it, it down. For special they events. would do it for a special. Yeah, special bring it event. in. You can yeah. take them apart. Yeah, yeah, you take, and they're very easily stored. And is there any in Ireland? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Gar Houlihan, who's the pre the president of Irish squash, he's very being very proactive at the moment in trying to get one over here because what's happening is we have so many. Uh, good top level junior players in, in fact one of which I have to give a shout out to Sam Buckley who's he reached the quarter the semi-finals of the European Junior Boys Under 19 Championships today he's oh, playing wow. right. he's in Prague so good luck Sam uh, he the, the kids who are playing at this level need to practice on the glass court because it's such a different feel when you're hitting the ball completely different and they, they would and have to travel on them when they go yeah, abroad so they, they literally would go to, to Bristol or Manchester or something to get the practice time right. whereas now Gar Houlihan is really being very active about trying to get one that we can keep in Ireland and, and we can sort of erect wherever there's a tournament yeah. um, in two no next Tuesday is the beginning of the Irish Open Championships in Fitzwilliam so it's I think I want to say it's a satellite I don't know what level of pro tournament it is but there's going to be professionals coming from America Germany Egypt if, if anybody's interested in going to it's yeah. next week okay. from Tuesday the 23rd all week it's the Irish Open Championships so the week of April the 23rd um, onwards after, be, so, just after Easter then. so for example in the future when we have this event to have a glass court erected out maybe in the parking lot or car park I should say yeah 
uh, would be It's amazing because visually it's very eye-catching and I know with athletics they've done stuff like that as well, bringing events, um, you know, jumping or events into the middle of shopping centres just to publicise yeah. the sport, let people have a look at it and stimulate interest. You're walking through Grand Central Station, you're just going to get your train and suddenly you see this yeah. incredible sport. Uh, yeah, right that's, it, that's the one that caught my eye because I saw a video of it, it looked yeah. incredible. When we're in Birmingham, <coughs> sorry to keep yeah. interrupting, in May they're, they're putting one up for the, world, for the Europeans, so wow. I'm excited to wow. get a hit on that. So, so you're doing all of that. So you're now your coach. Uh, you're you're a fitness coach as well. You're playing competitive at the highest level that you ever played. Yeah. Um, and somehow, in the middle of all of this, Orla Daharji, uh you managed to perform as an electric you picnic. Bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain to our listeners how you came to perform at electric oh picnic? Oh my goodness! Uh, okay. We so played squash. No, I was not playing squash. Um, you're going to make me say it. <laughs> I used to dabble in a little bit of stand-up comedy. Uh, nice. and, and it wasn't initially something I ever sort of went after. But when I moved home from America, I uh, was friendly with a group of ladies who played tennis in Port Barnock. And we'd go up and we, I never used to drink gin. And they introduced me to gin and tonics. The and ruin we, of many. Yeah. And we would sit out there on the balcony in the bistro and have our gins. And they suddenly had this like, notion in their head that, oh, Orla is very funny. And, you know, the way I look at it is everybody who's Irish is funny. <laughs> you, I mean, you go to America, an Irish person is hilarious. Um, and whether it was, I don't know, my delivery, I don't know what, but uh, one of them, Jennifer Hurst, I'll never forgive you for this, she put my name forward to uh, a Love in Dublin post that came up on Facebook. Have you got any mates who you think are funny? We're looking for a new talent, we'll say. So she put my name in and I suddenly got this phone call from the guy who runs Cherry Comedy at Whelan's and he said, come on, they wouldn't put you forward if they didn't think you were funny and there was no way I would ever show any interest in, you know, stand-up stand comedy. comedy. Anyway, between one thing and another, he convinced me to do it and uh, I basically, I, I don't tell jokes at all. I basically did eight minutes where I talked about my life, some of the stuff that you've, you've heard about. I elaborated on, you yeah. know, wanting to be a nun when I was a kid and being married twice. I didn't mention that my current wife was bridesmaid in my first wedding. And, <laughs> you know, there's lots of stuff thrown in there. Anyway, the comedy went well for that eight minutes. And lo and behold, I was getting calls to do some more stuff around the country. I went to Limerick, went to Cork, went to Wexford. And then uh, Emily O'Callaghan was at the Funny Women Championships for Ireland. And uh, I did the, you know, my eight minutes talking about the wooden spoon and, you know, the usual stuff we all dealt with when we were kids. And she came up and she said, you're great. She said, I I'm putting on a women's only comedy show with, with Joanne McNally at Electric Picnic. Joanne McNally, who's yeah. really successful. And Joanne is fantastic. Amazing. And she's, she comes out to Port Marnock a fair few times. She's brilliant. Uh, she'd be now the person I'd most aspire to be like if I were to stick with comedy. <laughs> but so I was invited to do this, and so I did perform at Electric Picnic last September. In in um, in front of how many was, people? Uh, no, it was it was the Hazelwood, so it wouldn't have been your gigantic crowd. Yeah. So it, was, it was probably a couple of thousand, I'd say. But to me, stand-up comedy must be the most terrifying thing to yeah. do from yeah. the outside. You're totally exposed. You're you're trying to get a reaction from people. Competitive sport is a safe environment compared yeah. to that, I think. How did you have the yeah. courage to do it? I think the, the first night I did it at Whelan's, I was sick to my stomach. It was absolutely nerve-wracking. Um, but I think when you get that first laugh, you sort of relax and you take a deep breath and, and then it, you kind of just keep, you flow, you know. So I think I was very lucky, I suppose, that I never really got any booze. Maybe they <laughs> felt sorry for me. Um, and I think telling the truth also helps. Like, I everything I talk about is true and, right. and you know Irish people we tend to laugh at ourselves and we you know self-deprecating a lot yeah, and, yeah and, that's and, natural for us and um, and it worked and I, I have to say it gave me an incredible confidence did it? Uh, yeah something that I never really had um, interesting and you sort of I, I found myself kind of being like when I'm in a squash match for example if I'm losing or, or I'm down a few points I'll say to myself this is my stage I've got the mic you know, or something like that that'll kind of get me back into the zone. Um, so there's a link. It's Isn't that funny? That's it's fascinating. Just, you just made me think about that now. It's fascinating. Yeah. There's actually a link yeah. for you in that performance element of yeah. doing that. Yeah, and that's maybe why I wear the jacket. Yeah. Maybe I'm a born performer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. um, and, um, so I don't do it anymore. I was just going to say, so are you, how, did you keep it up? You did Electric Picnic. What a yeah. buzz. It was incredible. It absolutely. I mean, definitely a highlight of my life. You know, bucket list. Yeah, definitely. You know, absolutely. I don't think I've ever would have had it on my bucket list, but yeah, there you go. I don't think I did either. <laughs> but um, 
what I will say is I still host a show in Pomarnock once a month where I'll bring in comedians and Joanne has been out twice and headlined for us and so I'll MC a little bit right. but because my squash really has taken off so much now that's my real priority is to right. really and, but, and, and is squash. it called anything in particular it's just Orla's laughter lounge it's you know right. It's, right. Yeah, you don't need to know about it. I mean, it's goodness. great. You want to come to Pomarnock? What a life you've April. led, Orla. I feel so boring. <laughs> oh God, I no. feel so so under under uh, underactive it. having met you. Yeah. Um, and how is your health now? Would you say? I'd say my health is probably at its best. Knock on wood. Um, I am fitter than I've ever been. Uh, I'm happier than I've ever been. And I, I think it all has to do with the, the Helped squash. by your lovely wife, I presume, as well. She's fantastic, yeah. She's we a lunatic. Her, we haven't given her a name. Debbie. Sorry, right. Debbie. She's in America at the moment, uh, clearing out one of the old houses that we had. So it's we're definitely staying in Ireland now, which right. is great. When we first moved, moved back three years ago, we weren't sure. Um, but we're both sort of thriving in our sports. Yeah. She teaches pickleball, which it's a whole other... What is pickleball? So pickleball is, so I would say, in a nutshell, it's giant table tennis. Right. Played on a badminton court. Uh, four people, is a, a low net to the ground about this high. And the bat is sort of plastic, solid. Um, and what kind of a ball? It's a, a very... Uh, about this size plastic with holes in it. Oh, like, like an air ball. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's probably the fastest growing sport in North America. Go away. And pickleball. Pickleball. It's There's great. a new one for your listeners. We yeah. never even heard of it before. It's fantastic. The, 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 the Irish Open is actually the end of the month in Multi Farnham. And then we're, we're having a tournament in Malahai Castle in July. For Go away. Like, people coming from Germany. We played in the Spanish Pickleball Championships last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, incredible. A whole other thing, but it's great sport. Really, really fun. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, one of the things I was curious about as well was: uh, is, has there been a little bit of a renaissance in Irish squash? Because I remember, like, I'm a child of the '70s, and it was squash was huge in Ireland, and they were professional. They were private clubs, like gyms, all around the country. Yeah. And then a lot of them seemed to close down. And as I said, Madeleine Perry, I knew, was sort of a you know the flag bearer for Irish squash for a long time and played professionally. But is the game? It, it, do you? Think the game is having a resurgence? I do, I do, and it's just there aren't enough voices out there to, to sort of sh share. Um, it's thriving, it's thriving. Um, I had a great conversation with Paul Nugent, who's the CEO of Irish Squash, uh, a couple of days ago, and he was filling me in stuff I didn't even know. There, there, there are clubs all around the country. There's one in, in uh, I have to just have a quick look at my notes. I know I see Celtic uh, Squash Sorry, because in, I go into Waterford and okay, I often pass so it and know. I can see that's a professional, there's a club there that works yeah, like it's a So game. they actually got a sports capital grant last year and they have two glass back courts there. So it kind of went from being dormant to now thriving with right. over 100 players. There's a place in Wexford called Barnstown, oh, which yeah. uh, they actually just bought two glass back walls from a club in England that closed down, believe it or not. They're bringing them back and they're going to, uh, that, and that place apparently is thriving in Barnstown. I believe there's so one in Ballyshannon as well that, that has, has uh, a guy again. named Ivan. So one of the things that we were saying, you know, the difference between squash in, in America and Ireland is, in Ireland it's very much volunteer based. Of right? course, in yeah. America, everybody is paid to do it. They're, I mean, they're, they're they probably employ a hundred people and they're in US squash, whereas we have poor old Paul by himself. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's very much, you need sort of champions of the game, ambassadors of the game. Uh, I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I kind of am. I came home, went to Port Marnock and there was nothing happening. And now I have 75 kids playing. Uh, we have a community of about 50 adults playing. And so because I have the time and the passion and this chap, Ivan um, O'Malley, I think his name is up in Ballyshanna, he's done the same thing in Donegal. Wow. He's sort of, you know, he's brought the passion. And it's sort of it's sort of hundred members apparently. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of sprinkling. I mean, De La Salle College um, is now in Waterford introduced squash as a PE. Yeah, because uh, because I'm presuming they can go up to Celtic. There's there's yeah. They can teachers can take them up. There's a place for them to play. Yeah. But exactly. there are they seem to be um there seem to be courts popping up around the place. And yeah, obviously that were there and they're just being yeah re reinvigorated. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean to the to the to the sum of I think two hundred fifty thousand was given in grants last year to clubs capital around the country. Right. And it's, you know, junior squash is thriving as well. Um, I'll just briefly tell you about Sutton Lawn Tennis Club, which is where I happen to play uh, league. Owen Ryan has done an incredible job. They have five courts there now at the moment. Five courts? Yeah, and he has probably, I'd say, and I'm hoping I'm getting this right, over 250 kids play every single day. That club is packed. And wow. I mentioned Sam Buckley, who's in the semifinals of the Europeans, plays there. And there are three uh, players who are in Prague at the moment from Sutton. Um, that are playing, I'd say, 70% of all the juniors, of all the 
Irish representative kids are from Sutton, if that right. makes sense. Yeah, something. like it's, yeah, it's, it's um, obviously growth. It's, it's booming. Uh, three of the lads who are picked to go to the Europeans with our team are from Sutton. Uh, first timers, uh, same as myself. And it's just, I mean, junior squash, you've got your interprovincials, so about three weeks ago, I think they had uh, the junior interpro, so all four provinces came together right. from ages 11 up to 19. Every province submits a team of yeah. five players. I mean, it's definitely. It's out there and it's happening and right. it's booming. We're and just not seeing kids it. Kids are loving it. And I'm telling you, it's a great opportunity to get a scholarship to go to America. Yeah. There are kids, uh, Brianne, who's on, on my team, went What's to George name? Washington. Brianne Flynn. Right. She's the Irish number two. She got a scholarship to go to George Washington. Um, she was there for four years. And also Oshin Logan, who's, who was in the same college with her. Um, David Ryan, whose owner and son was in Harvard for four years and ended up winning I've the been. national championships. He was, he was a in America. Number one, unseeded. Wow. Or I think it was and who's the Irish w number one woman? Um, it's Sophie O'Rourke. So Sophie, I think, I want to say she's, a, she's going to be 19, if not currently. No, she's going to the European teams this week, so she must be almost 19. So right. you can't be 19 and play. So she's still um, that young. But she's from Cork. Right. Oh, it's Cork, right. Yeah, yeah, she's a fantastic little player. Feisty, feisty, feisty. She's amazing. So yeah, if you ever get a chance to watch her play, she's unbelievable. Right. Um, and your plan now is to... First of all, play Europeans. Yes. In, the, in when again do we say there are? They are at the starting the first of May. So we've got squad weekends coming up the next two weekends, where all the teams where are will be the together. They're in Birmingham. Right. Okay. Edge Baston Priory. Okay, and that's the start of May. First of May to the fifth. Okay. Yeah. And then your World Masters Championships, which you want to go that's to. That's going to be another year from August. So between now and then, what I need to do, I sort of have to establish a ranking. Uh, I'm currently 15 in Europe. I went in at 60, I think, and because I've won Slovenia and Spain, you, you, your ranking goes up. Is this but in I, your age group? My age, yeah. yeah. So I need to get probably three or four more tournaments under my belt um, and obviously do well in them to kind of get... Because when I go to Worlds, it's always better if you have a top ranking, a top seeding. Uh, yeah, I presume sort of that is going to help you in your draw. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so you want goal, to get so. your ranking up. Yeah. And then where so are those worlds? And they're are they in Poland. 2020? 2020, August. Right. Um, they're in Poland and apparently the facility is unbelievable. They have 32 squash courts. It's in a giant warehouse. Wow. Um, and people from all over the world now, there are some incredible... Like Sarah Fitzgerald, who I mentioned earlier, I trained with her in Caversham. She was five-toe world champion. Now she'll come over and play in the over 50s. Right. And so I think anybody who enters the over 50s is probably... It's going to be pretty competitive. Yeah, yeah. And did you play with the world number one recently? I somewhere? did, I did. And I told her yesterday I'd give her a shout out. Uh, she Renim, from, she's from? She's from, Renim el -Walili. she's from Egypt. Right. Um, and she was yesterday, the day before, she, she won the DBT uh, Open in the Netherlands. And I sent her a little text to congratulate her yesterday and she wrote back and she said, Orla, it's because I had that lucky penny you gave me. <laughs> so when I played her in Birmingham a couple of weeks back... Uh, I, I always went wherever I go. I'll bring something from Ireland to give to my opponents. Just a nice touch. <laughs> so um, you anyway, gave her the lucky penny. Was, yeah. So how did you get to play the world number so this one? Is, Here, this well, is the question I'm, I ask. Kind of selfish thing, but also I was wanting to support my friend Dion Safri. Uh, is launching a program uh, called Empower Girl Squash in uh, Birmingham, and it's a very similar program to the ones that Debbie and I ran in the in states. America. So it's for for low income uh, girls predominantly. Um, they she she gets them playing squash, she helps them with their uh, academics and then she provides a nutritious meal. So she is the first one in England, I think. No, there might be another one. I, anyway, she is launching this program and when I saw on Facebook that her launch included having four of the top ten players in the world, including Renee Melvilleli, Sarah Jane Perry, who's world number six, Tesney Evans, world number nine, and then Nicole David, who at the at the moment is world number ten, but literally is the greatest player of all time. She's ten-time world Where champion. Where is she from? She's from Malaysia. Right. She would be now your, your G-O-A-T, we call her, the greatest yeah, of all greatest. time. So those four people are just going to be a 45 minute flight away. You know, <laughs> and I want to support Dion, of course. And in, you're, in on you're on that so, flight. You're on that flight, Orla, um, straight away. Yeah, so uh, I got on court with both Sarah Jane and, and Renim and just had the absolute best time. Just to have a knock up, like. Basically. Yeah, so they were, it, was, it was a fundraiser for the programme, so you, right. would, you would pay to play with the pro. Right, and okay. you know it was twenty pounds or something. It was easy. So um, well, the funny thing was they didn't really know who they didn't know what, who I was. So when I got on with her name with this well, very very, the very gold long, jacket. I was wearing the gold jacket. <laughs> of course I was. Um, we had a very very long rally for about a minute, which in squash terms is quite long. Yeah. And um, 
I ended up subsequently just winning the first rally, and uh, <laughs> yes! that was it. I said, "That's it." I, you know, you, I could die happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I have to say, for professional squat players, the four li girls who were there, they're so approachable and friendly and easy to get on, and we're happy to talk to anybody. They're just, I think, You're not dealing players, with agents or anything. No, there's stuff, no, it's yeah. just amazing. I mean, you know, Renim gave me her phone number. To, to, you know, she said, I'm going to follow you because she knows I'm competing in the Worlds. And when I'm at the British Masters at the end of May, they're also having the, the professional British Open at the same time in the same venue. And, you know, everybody just... Looks in together. It's fantastic. It's yeah. really a great experience. Well, it's a, it's a sport that has always, uh, as I said, I remember being really big in the 70s and also because everyone said, if you want a sport that is incredibly good for your um, for, for endurance fitness and for cardiovascular, yeah. that for a start it's a great sport to it's play. Great. And you're not running after a ball that goes over a net. It's in the it's in, you know, yeah. it's there and you just pick it up grab and you go again and it's a yeah. it's a fun, I mean, 35 to 45 minutes of a workout and Serious you're workout. happy. And, and something that really interested me and I think it was part of what caught my eye about you first as well is you're you're finding you found your your success and you're finding your joy in your sport that yeah. you were really good at when you were young much later in life yeah um and does it make you reflect on why do women give up sports so so early or we, like we know there's a high dropout sport very often because people have families and have children yeah i was going to um, say and, it. And, um, and what's your advice to women about about competitive sport and the opportunity to go back into competitive yeah. sport i mean i think number one i'm i don't have children and that has been sort of a I don't want to say lucky thing for me, but it definitely, I think women who go off and have families, definitely their priorities change and it takes away from their time and availability to of commit course, to something. Of course, um, we know but I, I, I think if, you know, you should always make time for yourself and if you can, whatever sport it is, it's that, like I said, it's a little bit of joy that'll bring to you. It just, I don't know, it's, it's, for me, it's changed the way I look at things. It, I'm happier. Um, because I'm 48, doesn't matter. You know what? It's it's it's. I'm kind of stalling here now. No, it's to cut that out. It's it's it, it, to come back to that one saying, it, for you, it, it, it's not a factor. Your age isn't a factor. Clearly, no. you're in great physical shape. Yeah, and that definitely helps. Um, I don't spend as much time on the squash court as I do. I spend more time in the gym um, because there's a lot of twisting and turning in squash, and the hips and the knees go. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, one of the things I talked with about just this other lady, Rosie Barry, I told you about earlier. She's the she was uh, an Irish lady who was uh, voted in as vice president of the European Squash Federation, and one of her main responsibilities is master squash. So just getting back to the, right. you know, the over thirty fives, um, she really wants to sort of help get more women back playing. Yeah. And within Ireland, we sort of have this plan uh, with my help to do some sort of um, regular coaching where we'll get anybody who, maybe they played for Ireland as juniors, and I have so many friends who did, and then they put the rackets down in their early 20s, and an opportunity to just come back. And, you know, don't expect to be as good as you used to be, no. but, but it's, it's getting out there and getting the sweat going, and you remember how good it feels, and there's you know, you're with your friends. I think in a racket sport, there's nothing like that time when you hit, when you make a perfect contact yeah, with, yeah. with whether it's a shuttlecock or a ball. Yeah. It's yeah. a beautiful and it's feeling, isn't it? It is. And it's also the camaraderie of, you know, I've connected with people who I hadn't seen in over 20 or 30 years now because especially in, in this past uh, Masters Interprovincials weekend, there were people who played as juniors and now they're back playing. And, and it's just, it's fun. And you can see, uh, you know, their kids have grown up and now they're coming back to yeah. it. And it's, it's time. Like, when your kids grow up, definitely make the time. Don't say, that's it now, I'll just go walk the dog on the beach, which is equally well, very important. I, I think maybe it's a lack of confidence, you it, know. Oh, yeah. Women's bodies change dramatically yeah. when they have children. Yeah. Um, they also can go into gyms and be intimidated by a lot of younger people around them and, a, yeah. you know, a, a sort of very macho environment sometimes, I think. Yeah. Um, so I think there's an element there. We know women lack confidence, you that's, know, about a lot of things. That's a huge part of it. It really is. And it was definitely part of it for me. And a lot of it was self-belief. And I will say that I've, I've kind of been working on my own sort of mental side of things. Um, reading a, a really good book at the moment by DC Gonzalez called uh, the geez I can't remember the name of it now it'll come to me <laughs> it'll come to uh, you but it's that. about mental sort of strength and uh, what it's showed me is self-belief and confidence is a huge part of performing yeah um, and I think of, uh, like you said a lot of women I'm going I'm sure I'm going through perimenopause uh, you know the night sweats and, and the, the whole nine yards and we're, we're all going to go through it but 
sport is going to help with that as well. Yeah. You know, and and I think it's you take the attitude of do I decide that I'm not going to do it or decide I'm going to do it. And you know, even if you get out there two or three times a week, whatever your sport is, you're going to feel good. And we'll finish off by you telling us about your. Sometimes you um, you have older women come to a, a class, your classes. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting now that I've I've sort of uh, I'm dabbling now in personal training. Well, I shouldn't say dabble because it's my living. And the majority of my clients are probably women over 50, over 60, some of them. And uh, it may be partly because I'm a friendly face, um, but, you know, we talked earlier about gyms where you've got the big guys who go in and they drop the weights and they're you know, looking at themselves in the mirror. And, and I think women who are in their 50s and 60s want an environment where it's safe and it's friendly and it's comfortable and uh, non-threatening. And I think I can help with that and, and, and I'm hoping just by being out there and doing the squash thing and doing the personal training that I could sort of encourage women to just well, I think there's probably lots of people like you. They may not have jumped back in at the level that you've yeah. jumped back in, Orla, but certainly I think there yeah. are a lot of women who, you know, love their sport, may have gone away from it, just might not might not be sure about whether they should go back Come in. Come so back. If, if yeah. Come if back. you're looking for a role model, here is one who absolutely you've got <laughs> everything. You know, you have you have the joy, we can see the joy, um, yeah. we can see the life, we can see we can see the elite the elite level, we can see the competitiveness. Yeah. But it's all there and it's all come back to life for you. And it's not all about winning, I want to say. It's like when I you know, in Spain and Slovenia there's beginners playing in the age groups that I'm in. And Is it's there? yeah, it's 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 having a good time and enjoying it. And that's why I'm doing so well is because I'm enjoying it. So it doesn't you know, don't worry about the oh I won't be good enough, wouldn't be good enough. It doesn't matter. Right. Get out there and play. Well, Lucas, long may you enjoy it, long may you thrive you. and get better, and long may you bring colour to yes. the courts, to the squash courts of the world. It's been lovely Darcy. talking to you. It's I been love fantastic. the hair, the colour. Like, we need to get a photograph. <laughs> we need to get a photo together. <laughs> it's been great to have you in, and we hope, listeners, that that uh, will inspire people. Um, if you've been out of sport or you know, you're, you've lacked confidence in sport and have given up or are afraid to go back at any level, Orla Darty is a brilliant example um, how it's changed your yeah. life, I think. Yep. So, um, for future reference, uh, you can find, as I said, all our previous episodes on iTunes or on the offtheball.com. Uh, Go into their podcast links and you'll find all our off the benches in there. And we hope you enjoyed our latest one. Thanks for listening.